Um, hello and welcome to Selecting Healthier Carpet, Flooring and Furniture, Tips and Tools for Purchasers. Uh, this is Sarah Packer with the Built Environment Program at the Center for Environmental Health and Judy Levin, our Program Director, and I are so excited to have you all with us today. Um, and we're thrilled to be joined by two fabulous guest speakers, Suzanne Drake, Senior Des Designer at Revel, and uh, Chris Kokafer, President of K Chesterfield. We will more thoroughly introduce them soon. Um, we're so excited to have them with us today to share their, their expertise and insights. We know that selecting environmentally preferable products for interior spaces can be complicated, and our goal is to try to make it simpler for you. As purchasers, designers, and manufacturers, you can drive the market towards safer products for everyone, and we thank you so much for your commitment to health and sustainability. The session is being recorded, and it um, is planned to run for 75 minutes, and you'll all receive the recording and the slide set within a few days. Um, we're going to take questions at the end. Um, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A um, box. Uh, you can put them in at any time during the session. We'll take them at the end. If you put a question in the chat, we might not see it. So please do use that Q&A box um, for your questions. So first, I'd love to introduce Suzanne Drake. Drake from Revel. Revel is an architecture and interior design firm located in San Francisco, specializing in corporate interiors. Um, Revel is proud of their diversity and recently completed their LGBTQ owned certification. They're focused on bringing cleaner interior environments to their clients while having fun. Uh, Suzanne specializes in creating healthy commercial environments and being the conduit for healthy materials knowledge dissemination. As an interior designer, she draws on over two decades of experience in workplace, healthcare, and laboratory environments to support client initiatives and sustainability goals. She currently leads Revel Sustainability Initiative and was instrumental in developing the precautionary list and has co-authored three installments of the Healthy Environment Healthy Environments white paper series focused on the built environment, including ones on flame retardants, PVC, and antimicrobials, all things that we'll be talking about today. Her book, EcoSoul, Save the Planet and Yourself by Rethinking Your Everyday Habits was published in 2013. Welcome, Suzanne. And uh, Kay Chesterfield, I'd love to uh, welcome Chris Kokofer, who's the president of Kay Chesterfield. Uh, Kay Chesterfield is a certified woman-owned business located in Oakland uh, since 1921 and focusing on keeping office furniture out of the landfill. Uh, we encourage, they encourage furniture specifiers to choose well-made soft seating so that uh, they can reupholster the product when the fabric shows wear. Uh, Chris has had uh, many roles in the contract furniture world for over 25 years. Her most passionate endeavor has been owning Kay Chesterfield for, the, for nine years. And Chris is on a mission to educate furniture specifiers about the upsides of reupholstering contract soft seating. Um, the bigger pr the project, the better. She currently works with San Francisco International Airport, Kirkland and Ellis, Kaiser Permanente Healthcare, University of California, San Francisco, and many other Bay Area companies. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for being here with us. Um, so uh, Center for Environmental Health, uh, where Judy and I work, um, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the public from exposure to toxic chemicals. One of the ways we do this is by partnering with large scale purchasers from government, private business, higher education, uh, the design and architecture world, and others like you to leverage their, your significant buying power and use your purchasing dollars to incentivize manufacturers to move markets to produce more environmentally preferable products, or what we call EPP. In addition to carpet, flooring, and furniture, which are our topics for today, CEH also focuses on foodware and we also offer a broad um, range of guidance around the development and implementation of um, environmentally preferable purchasing, EPP policies and practices. So please reach out to us if you are on a mission. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about um, chemical policy in the US and the chemicals that we encounter in our built environment. So most people assume that if a chemical is on the market, it's been already been determined to be safe. And unfortunately, this is just not the case with most chemicals um, being largely unregulated in the US. So there are over 82,000 chemicals registered in the US. And um, in 1976, uh, 
the U.S. passed the Toxic Substances Control Act, which put in place a framework for chemical assessment. Um, but since uh, the majority of these chemicals were already in existence and use prior to that, they were not subject automatically to that assessment. So um, of the new chemicals that have come on the market since the policy was adopted, about 85% have lacked health data to assess the safety of those chemicals and 67% have no data on health or environmental impacts. So um, that law, the Toxic Substances Control Act was updated in 2016, but it still far, falls woefully short of providing the kind of assessment and protection that we need um, when it comes to chemicals and chemical regulation. For example, the EPA only prioritized 10 chemicals for assessment in the first year of the new act and only 20 uh, chemicals for assessment in the second year. So with tens of thousands of chemicals being actively used in commerce, it's easy to see um, that we'll continue to be exposed to untested chemicals for decades to come. Given this broken system that we currently have in place, um, exercising your purchasing and spec specifying power to prefer healthier products is one of the most effective ways that you can protect public health and move the market away from chemicals of concern. So I'm going to turn it over to Judy, who's um, going to uh, give us a little demo on what we call chemical whack-a-mole. Great, thank you. Um, so all too often what happens is that when one known chemical is found to be bad, such as back in the 70s, we discovered that chlorinated tris, uh, excuse me, Sarah, I can't animate it. So if you wouldn't mind animating it, thank you, uh, was a mutagen, which means it damages your genetic uh, material uh, permanently and can lead to cancer. So when they found that in kids' pajamas, they knew they had to get out of it because it was being exposed. So what did they do? They switched to a, a chemical cousin called brominated tris, which probably not unsurprisingly, was also found to be a mutagen, switching from one toxic chemical to the next. Next, Sarah. And then when we uh, found out many years later that flame retardants were being used in our furniture, we found out that even though chlorinated tris and brominated tris had been removed from children's pajamas, they were back in furniture and baby products. Like, what's that about? So next. So then once we discovered it in furniture that that was a problem, we switched to pentabde, which was also found to be highly toxic and highly persistent and phased out of commerce. And rather than really assessing a whole new way of looking at things, they just switched to another flame retardant called Firemaster 550, and there's many other versions of that, which are linked to obesity and anxiety and probably some other uh, effects that we don't know yet because it's not that that old. Next slide, uh, next animation, excuse me. And finally, we just recently shifted to organophosphates, which nobody knew much about. But what we're learning is there's a mounting body of evidence that shows these have some of the very same toxicity issues as the others. So while this is all being experimented with, we are the guinea pigs. So I'm gonna turn back to Sarah. Yeah, and unfortunately what we're seeing is the same uh, game of whack-a-mole playing out with lots of other um, types of chemicals. And so, um, of course, evaluating tens of thousands of chemicals um, for each individual chemical um, is, is impossible or unworkable, um, given that we've got 80,000 or more out there. Um, and so one way of sort of simplifying this process is um, uh, using a framework that Green Science Policy uh, Institute developed uh, for grouping chemicals by similar qualities related to their function and structure. So um, we call this the class approach and it has gotten a lot of traction and uh, since it was int introduced by uh, GSPI. Um, and taking a class approach really allows us to assess chemicals um, that have very similar characteristics and uh, um, allows us to go a lot further in addressing some of the most problematic chemicals and helps us to prevent that game of whack-a-mole um, that Judy just demonstrated where we're just making minor tweaks to, or industry is making minor tweaks to chemical structure and then are able to, re to introduce that chemical even though it has a lot of the same concerns as its predecessor. So we call this the class approach. Um, 
We know that uh, when we're talking about materials in, that we use inside of the built environment, we often think about indoor air quality, and rightfully so. Uh, the EPA has estimated that most people in the U.S. spend up to 90% of their time indoors, and with COVID, um, that amount time of time spent indoors may have even gone up. Um, energy efficiency, which is really important um, for environmental um, benefits, can also result in buildings being sealed more tightly, and that can decrease ventilation and can lead to increased concentrations of indoor pollutants. Luckily, the importance of good ventilation is being recognized more now, but we still need to keep harmful chemicals from circulating in our indoor spaces. Uh, studies conducted by the EPA and others have also shown that indoor air quality can sometimes have levels of pollutants up to five times worse than outdoor air. And we know outdoor air can be really polluted. So um, we, we need to be really mindful of, of what is being brought into our indoor environments. So whether at home or at work or in school, our indoor air quality is a major concern because it has been found to impact the health, comfort, well-being, productivity, and cognitive function of those in our spaces. Um, a study from Harvard measured cognitive function in spaces um, comparing typical amounts of VOCs, of uh, volatile organic compounds, compared to lower VOC settings and found that on average, people performed 61% better when in a reduced VOC environment than in a typical one and 101% better in what they called their enhanced green conditions, which was a condition where the VOCs were lower and there was better ventilation. So some of the cognitive areas that were assessed included things like crisis response, information usage, and strategy. So um, really big difference in performance and cognitive ability um, in, a, in an environment with typical VOC levels versus one where the VOC levels are low and the ventilation is good. So it's really important to be thinking about that. Um, a lot of high stakes decisions are being uh, made in our spaces and um, just our ability to use and use extra uh, information and, and develop strategies are being affected by the chemicals in our air inside. Um, chemicals also affect a lot of our other, uh, our other systems in our bodies um, and have been linked to a number of health concerns. So uh, the chemicals found in uh, conventional products that we're talking about today can affect our learning, especially in children. They affect our hormones, our reproductive health, our breathing, our immune systems, and many have been linked to a number of cancers. And we know that the incidence of many diseases, including several types of cancers um, that have been linked to chemical exposure are on the rise. One particularly concerning group of chemicals are um, endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs. Uh, these are synthetic human-made chemicals that mimic, block, or alter the activity of our body's natural hormones. And this can happen in even really small doses. Um, and the reason we're so concerned about them is that hormones direct almost every function of our bodies, from our growth and development to how we process everything from fear to sugar. They shape our fertility, our behavior, our physical and mental development, our cognition, our metabolism, and our longevity. So, um, Studies have shown that EDCs can cause diabetes, uh, weight gain and difficulty losing weight. They harm our fertility. They can promote cancer um, as well as a, a number of other diseases. And lots of chemicals are EDCs or have endocrine disrupting properties. Um, and so they're found in lots of different types of products. And studies have shown that um, humans living today can have up to 90% 90, uh, 90 of humans living today have some evidence of hormone disrupting chemicals in our bodies. Um, babies and young children are particularly vulnerable because their bodies are rapidly developing um, and hormones play a big role in that. And as I mentioned before, our current system for regulating chemicals um, has, there are a lot of misconceptions built into that, including the one that the greater amount of a chemical you're exposed to, the worse the effect. And that approach doesn't really work with hormone disruptors because um, when they're in the small amounts, that's when they can be um, received and have that impact on our body because they're mimicking our own, our own hormones. Um, and these exposures during these critical developmental stages can lead to lifelong health impacts and in some cases can be passed down um, through further generations. 
Uh, we also know we need a healthy immune system um, to fight off infections, including COVID-19. Studies have shown that PFAS chemicals, um, which is a class of chemical we'll talk a bit more about later, can actually suppress our immune systems, making us more susceptible to contracting infections like COVID-19. And we also know that many of the chemicals that contribute to the underlying conditions such as diabetes, heart and respiratory problems, um, all these things make us more susceptible to having a bad response or bad, um, more severe experience of COVID-19. So um, these chemicals are really damaging not only our immune systems, but also um, get, putting our bodies in a position to um, not to have a worse experience with, with something like COVID-19. So how are we exposed to these chemicals? Um, a lot of times they're transmitted through inhalation, um, ingestion through our skin, um, and also ingestion of dust particles um, and food water and, and other materials that we're exposed to. Um, it's also important to recognize that many chemicals are um, transmitted across the placenta and through breast milk. And so um, that, given that, uh, that children are and developing babies are um, particularly susceptible to the impact of chemicals, it's important to remember that um, what goes into a, a mother's body can be um, transmitted. And then children are also uh, particularly susceptible because of their frequent hand-to-mouth activity. So they spend a lot of time on the floor, they put their hands in their mouth. Um, so that ingestion cycle is, is, um, can be pretty high. Um, it's also really important to think about the occupational exposures to toxic chemicals. Uh, when buildings burn, toxic chemicals are released into the air and everyone exposed to them can be affected. Uh, firefighters who fight residential fires have been found to be highly exposed to flame retardant chemicals and have significantly elevated levels of several different types of cancer, including multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, prostate and testicular cancer and others. Um, a study of San Francisco Bay Area women, fighter, women firefighters found that these women had six times higher rates of breast cancer than other women. And then workers who work with in, either in chemical production or with the products um, that the chemicals are used in um, across the life cycle of those products are also exposed to the chemicals in those products. Um, so um, people who work in manufacturing, installation, maintenance, uh, upholstery, reupholstery, recycling and disposal, all could be um, exposed to the chemicals in those products at those various phases. I'm gonna turn it over to Judy now to talk about furniture. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so why are we focusing on furniture? And it's partially because these products really persist in the, envir in the um, indoor environment for long periods of time. They can be a significant source of concern and can affect humans and the environment across the product's whole life cycle. Um, and furniture actually may be one of the easiest categories to address because many of the chemicals that are in furniture are unnecessary or safer alternatives exist. So that's important. And also healthier products are typically available. And guess what? They're also cost neutral or in some cases cost savings. And we hand move the market and we have moved the market. Next slide, please. Um, now that we have just a little bit of background, what Sarah talked about, we're gonna dive into what I call the hazardous handful, which are the five worst actor, five worst chemical actors found in furniture and textiles and also products, other products as well. And we're just gonna talk very briefly about each of these chemicals because we don't have a lot of time and you may not be interested in all the depth, but we're gonna do a brief dive on flame retardants, fluorinated stain treatments, antimicrobials, VOCs, and PVCs. Um, so great, I think we're going to uh, just go from there, go forward. Good, so the items bolded in green are the furniture components that most likely are likely to contain the specific hazardous I have handful chemicals in furniture. And you'll notice that fabric is the most likely component to need um, one of these chemicals of concern. So that's, therefore, it's really important that when you select furniture, you make sure that the fabric meets the requirements of the hazardous handful. And we have resources to help you with that. And the products in black are just some of the many 
other products that have these chemicals of concern and, and we could probably make a much bigger list. Next slide, please. The story of flame retardants is a long one, but we'll try to sum it up really quickly. Um, flame retardants were added to furniture from the 1970s till just about five years ago. And they were added with the thought that they would stop fires from starting and stop the spread, the, stop the spread of flames. But research showed that flame retardants were not effective at reducing either the frequency of fires or the severity of fires. And instead that these chemicals had very serious health concerns. And you can see those on the slide, I won't go over them. Um, these chemicals can migrate out of the products that they're in. And what they do is they attach to air particles like dust and then they settle on surfaces. And when we put our hands to our mouth as Sarah talked about, our babies crawl on the floor, they actually ingest these chemicals. Um, you'll see a kind of a pitch for the Chicago Tribune. They did a six part expose on the whole flame retardant industry. It's a really fascinating uh, series. I encourage you to look it up. And they called out the flame retardant industry's lies and deceptions about both the supposed fire safety benefit of their chemicals, as well as the chemical safety of the flame retardants used. And that was one of the key levers that led to the use of, um, led to the change of the flame retardant standard, furniture standard. Next slide, please. So uh, there are two uh, furniture flammability regulations. The most important one that you need to know about is Technical Bulletin 117, 2013. Um, this is the most common standard and it applies to almost virtually almost all buildings, except some very special occupancy buildings like hospitals or other healthcare settings, possibly dormitories and some other settings. Um, those buildings we'll talk about, they need to meet the TB133 standard. But to give you just a sense of how infrequently TB133 is used, furniture manufacturers have told us that over 99% of the furniture they sell meets TB117 2013. Very infrequently do they get requests for 133. Um, and while TB117 2013 started as a California standard, just last month, Congress passed a bill that directed the CPSC, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, to adopt TB117 2013 as the National Furniture Flammability Standard as of next month, June 25th of 2021. So that's very exciting. Um, and it's important because manufacturers now can meet these standards without the use of flame retardants all over the country. But the standard does not ban the use of these chemicals in the product. So it's important to understand that. So California several years ago and other states have passed bills that require the labeling of products such as you see on the left where a circle um, will be either, or a check mark will either be made under that the product does contain flame retardant chemicals or does not. And those of you sitting on chairs can feel free to uh, look under your chair at some point and see what your chair says. Um, okay, so just a, minute, just a minute ago, I said that special occupancy buildings may, not, may need to meet TB117, but actually, Buildings that are fully fire sprinklered, like hospitals and healthcare settings that are fully fire sprinklers, do not have to meet TB 133. Instead, they can meet TB 117 2013. And um, you know, it's found that flame, excuse me, if they can use 117 2013 if they are fully fire sprinklered, because that is a much better fire protection method. So we're going to talk a little bit about the differences very quickly. Next slide. It's worth noting just a couple of the differences. Um, first of all, TB133 is typically met with lots of flame retardants um, in the, firm, the foam, the fabric, and or the barrier cloth. So, um, and TB117-2013, as we said, can be met without their use. Also, TB133 furniture is, very, is a lot more expensive than TB117-2013. I've heard estimates anywhere from 25 to 50% less uh, more than TB117 2013. So whenever possible, unless you're in a building that's a special occupancy building and the fire marshal has told you, you must use TB133 because you don't have a fire sprinkler system, you should be selecting TB117 2013, which is, is the norm. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk a little bit about PFAS chemicals. Um, these, I won't even tell you the full name, per and poly, well, per and poly fluoride, uh, floral alkyl substances, uh, but they're often known as PFAS, or some of you may have heard them as P PFCs. 
And they're a group now of some group, uh, the EPA just came out with a study saying there may be up to 9,000 different PFAS chemicals. And all of these chemicals are entirely man-made. So if you find them in the environment, someone has put them there. Um, and these are often used in stain, stain resistant treatments like in fabric, but also they're used in cookware, textiles, other clothing, disposable foodware, carpeting, and many, many other products. Um, they've been dubbed the forever chemicals because they have a very, very strong chemical bond that resists breakdown. So these chemicals are expected to last perhaps thousands of years, or in some cases, what we call like geologic eras. And in the US, every chemical plant that makes these chemicals has contaminated the nearby waterways. And that was shocking. Um, we all have PFAS chemicals in our bodies and even um, fetuses have been found to have PFAS in their bodies. Um, the health effects you can see, I'm not gonna go over them, but I do want to just say that similar to the whack-a-mole game we described about flame retardants, this is what's also happening in the PFAS world, moving away from um, the most well-known bad actors called PFOA and PFOS to these alternatives. Um, and the chemical industry did that with very little toxicity data on those products. And now mounting evidence shows that many of these chemicals that are, that are supposedly alternatives to PFAS and PFOA have the same problematic characteristics, as well as some new concerns. Um, food is um, implicated in many studies, especially eating food from contaminated waterways. So our recommendation is that given the health and hum you know, the human health concerns related to these compounds and their persistence in our environment, we recommend that you, you know, specify products that are free of fluorinated stain treatments. Um, oftentimes these stain tre treatments can be an added cost so not only are you forgoing these harmful chemicals by not specifying them, you're also lowering the cost of your products and potentially your carbon footprint as well. So instead, we suggest that you consider fabrics with wipeable surfaces, surfaces, excuse me, medium to darker colors with some pattern in the fabric that are probably less likely to show um, stains and also choose fabrics that can be cleaned with non-toxic fabric cleaners. That's the best way to clean furniture. Next slide. So you heard Sarah talk a little bit about volatile organic compounds. So I'm not going to go into it a lot, um, except to say VOCs include a wide variety of chemicals, including formaldehyde, probably the most well-known. And some of these chemicals have short-term health effects, and some have long-term health effects. Um, when you get into a car and it smells like new car, that's probably VOCs. And VOCs tend to evaporate from products over time, um, and then we breathe them in. Uh, some are admitted at high levels initially, and then they taper down as time goes on, whereas others have um, semi-volatile semi -VOC, semi -volatile VOCs, excuse me, and those are emitted more slowly from solid surfaces, materials. And formaldehyde, you'll find it in uh, furniture and pressed wood products, like particle board, plywood, and fiber board, also in glues and adhesives, and some textiles, even um, some permanent pressed fabrics. Uh, formaldehyde is a respiratory toxicant and asthma trigger and a known human carcinogen. And it can decrease fertility and increase the risk of spontaneous abortion in humans. Um, so we recommend that you specify products that meet these special indoor air quality standards, the California Department of Public Health Standard, and it's got a long name, or there are some eco labels, SCS, Indoor Advantage, Gold. There's different levels, but Gold or Green Guard, again, Gold, not the basic level. Next slide, please. Okay, so antimicrobials. Um, antimicrobials are chemicals that have been added to a wide variety of products, especially now during COVID. You probably see everything from antimicrobial, you know, obviously hand sanitizers, hand sanitizer to face masks to, I've seen it in underwear and socks. Um, and many times they're marketed with claims of being very effective at controlling and preventing infections. So it may sound like a benefit, but there's actually very little evidence, if any, to support that reducing the microbe load on a product actually reduces the spread of infection. Um, this discussion and much more is included in the excellent paper that you see on the right from Dr. Ted Shetler. Um, similarly, in the case of COVID, Dr. Joe Allen from Harvard reported, we don't have a single documented case of COVID-19 transmission from surfaces, not one. So furniture is not a source of transmission. 
as we as we understand it. Um, you can see on the slide how we're exposed and in some of the health effects. And these also are EDCs. And I failed to say that actually every chemical I think we've talked about up till now uh, has been an EDC. Um, the medical community is also concerned that the use of added antimicrobials in all these products that are unnecessary can contribute to, to the development of superbugs, bugs that are resistant to anti antibacterial treatment. And this is a very large public health issue because we need to be able to treat infections. So we recommend that you avoid products treated with antimicrobial chemicals. Um, often these products contain costs more. And so by avoiding these unnecessary chemicals, you're saving money as well as protecting public health and the environment. And we recommend that you follow the CDC recommendations regarding cleaning and disinfecting. Uh, Dr. Ted Fettler did a wonderful webinar for us. You can see the link um, when you get these slides, you'll be able to click on it and listen to his discussion. It's very enlightening. Next slide. Great. Um, PVC and other chlorinated plastics have a number of very concerning health and environmental problems throughout its whole life cycle. Sarah's gonna talk more about PVC, so I'm just gonna focus on our recommendation, which is that you avoid products with PVC. Uh, typically the fabric would be the place where you would find the biggest amount. And there may be very small components of furniture that still contain PVC because there just aren't alternatives available. And so we do have a 1% or less um, level that we accept as meeting the standard because of those very small parts. Uh, next slide. Great, so in summary, it all boils down to this. If you can put CEH and Healthcare Without Harm specifications in your request for information, or request for proposals or your contracts, you can avoid the hazardous handful. Or if you request products that meet, either BISMA 7.4.4, which Suzanne is gonna talk about in just a minute, um, or the green screen, which we'll also talk about in such a minute, in a minute, you can also avoid the hazardous handful. So there's some great alternatives out there. So thank you very much. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Suzanne. Oh, I'm sorry, one more slide. <laughs> False alarm. Um, the other issue I wanna bring up is end of life. There are really no safe options for disposal of furniture. If you place them into landfill, these chemicals will leach out and get into the air and ultimately into our water. And if you incinerate them at low temperature or they're burned under you know, unregulated uh, conditions like a fire in a home, um, they will produce those toxic um, combustion byproducts that are carcinogens. So we uh, recommend that you extend product life whenever possible. And we're really thrilled to have Chris Kokofer who could talk more about the benefits of this. But you'll see some other benefits, um, energy savings, waste to energy and landfill avoidance, CO2 reduction, natural resource savings, and again, help you meet your waste reduction goals. Okay, now I believe I'm turning it over to Suzanne. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you, Judy. Um, so I'm going to be talking about eco labels and standards. And there are so many out there and they address uh, lots of different issues. Um, there's so many, in fact, that it's become more confusing than helpful. Um, next slide, please. But because, uh, partially because not every product has the same or even any label. So um, I'm just gonna give you some advice right off the top. Um, just prioritize. When you start seeing lots of labels and declarations and whatnot, um, Number one, I prefer products that have a disclosure of some type, you, transparency. Um, we can't start making healthier choices about our products without knowing what we're starting with. So that's really important. And you may notice that the EPD, the Environmental Product Declaration, is not on the screen at all. Um, that's because an EPD is a life cycle assessment and it's not required to have detailed ingredient information in that report. Um, the second thing I would prioritize is preferring third-party verified labels over anything that's self-declared. Um, third-party labels like a BIFMA or a, a third-party HPD um, have been, uh, they can be either self-declared or self-certified. So you want to look for that, that clarification that says that it's, it is uh, third-party verified. Um, that will make sure that your data that you're seeing is the most accurate and that the report is more complete. 
it just always works out that way when a third party comes in and helps out. Um, and then finally, in terms of prioritization, prefer the multi-attribute type label or certification over a single attribute. Um, and I would say this is a bit of a broad statement, a bit, but um, it's generally a good rule of thumb. Products with a multi-attribute label typically have to be have had to provide more health and sustainability information on the product as well as the production methods. So it's more likely that the end result is going to be a cleaner product and a cleaner production method than others. Um, and in the case of cradle to cradle, at least um, there's a commitment on the part of the manufacturer to recertify on a regular basis. And every time they do, it has to get better and better. So um, I always prefer multi-attribute multi over single. So getting into some of the specifics here, um, disclosure. So the disclosure type um, are typically reports, um, especially the HPD, the health product declaration. It's a reporting standard. There's no value judgment there. Um, when you have one of these reports in your hand, you should be able to see all the chemicals that are used in the product and you can act on that information in any way that you see fit. So for example, you could um, screen it for the hazardous handful and make sure that that product doesn't have it. Um, a declare label also provides, in addition to that material listing, it also provides other points of information. So you see it twice on the screen here because in that way, it's kind of a multi-attribute. Um, and single attribute labels, these are all cert certifications provided um, specific to a, uh, to a product type. And the labels mean that the standard addresses only one, one aspect, one criteria of the product. Um, and these uh, most commonly, you're gonna see them around VOC emissions. Um, not all single attribute standards use the same criteria um, that need to be met in order to become certified. So you need to be clear on what has been measured and to what level and that you agree that that's a, a high enough level for you. So using a single attribute label, once you've learned them, they're very useful in that regard. But when you start to see a bunch of them together, it's hard to, to know what you're looking at. Um, and, and these types of labels also dif differ by product type. There's very, very specific. So for example, floor score measures VOCs for resilient flooring, but not rubber flooring. And the green label plus is only for carpet, but in general, for anything measuring VOCs, make sure it references the CDPH standard method. Um, I think Judy mentioned that earlier, um, or the ANSI BIFMA method for testing VOCs. Um, you'll know that that's a pretty good standard to try to meet. Um, and then lastly, on the multi-attribute multi labels, uh, this means the product's been audited by an outside or third party in many different categories. Usually there's different, um, there's like a combined score or rating, but again, you have to be familiar with the system in order to understand exactly what a standard's different levels of awards represent. Um, and I mentioned cradle to cradle earlier, it's a very credible label, but it's actually not transparent in the sense that you can't just look at it and see what the ingredients are of that product. Um, so if you are trying to avoid specific chemicals, you could go to their website, look around in their materials and their methodology. Um, but in the end, you may never be able to tell if a certain chemical has been used or not. Um, there are also four levels of certification and all of these multi attributes typically have multiple levels of certification and each level has different requirements to meet it. So you do need to be familiar. Um, generally speaking, I do really like the cradle cradle gold or platinum certification as a multi attribute standard. Um, so I'll leave you with that. Next slide, please. Um, so where do we find products that have any sort of transparency or any sort of certifications. Um, the best database that I know of right now is under Mindful Materials. Um, this is a subset of a larger interior design architectural product database. It includes furniture. Um, the best thing about this database is that it has a really robust filter. So if you become a registered user, which is totally free, I recommend it, um, you could sort and um, 
search in by category and by specific things. You can kind of see on the screen an example uh, close to the, the right hand side where the colors are. Um, you can see what's listed there, declare labels, um, and if it's PVC or free, PVC free or not. I'll, and you can open up any of those columns and, and dig into specifics. Um, if you're familiar with Material Bank, um, that's another database that's used for ordering samples. Um, they actually have a direct link to Mindful Materials. So again, that's a really good way to, to make sure that you're, you're looking for those products that have some sort of declaration that they're doing something better than the conventional. Um, I did mention there's furniture here. I would say it's mainly from the major office furniture manufacturers. Um, although within that filter uh, options, there is a healthier hospitals initiative button. So that can be useful. Um, so if you're really focused on furniture, um, you can try here, but I would, uh, this, the CEH and website is still a really good resource for furniture. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Level uh, is a multi-attribute label for furniture. It's modeled on lead in for uh, lead, which is a, for buildings, um, in the way that it has several categories, um, and there's points offered in each category. So the label, uh, which is level one, level two, or level three, reflects that final combined score, but it doesn't publish which points specifically were gained in getting to that score. So while there are categories for chemical ingredients avoidance, along with the other stuff, recycle content, manufacturing process, et cetera, you don't know necessarily if your level selection can meet the hazardous handful of restrictions unless your manufacturer can confirm that the product meets the specific credit 744 targeted chemical elimination. And this credit was developed for the program specifically by the Center for Environmental Health and Healthcare Without Harm. And they set that criteria to mirror CEH and Healthcare Without Harm's technical specs so that purchasers or specifiers can easily identify products that avoid the hazardous handful chemicals. So it's important to note that it is an optional credit. So you have to really confirm that that credit was met in that particular product. So the BIFMA standard is uh, the first third party standard to offer such a standard. Um, and as manufacturers begin to register their products to the new level standard, um, it's probably available mostly in the relatively new products, but it is going to become the easiest way to ensure that you're avoiding the hazardous handful. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one other item to note on BIFMA, uh, they also have this red dot, the BIFMA compliant dot. And to me, um, as a designer, I always am thinking that reminds me of the Living Building Challenge red list compliant red dot. And that somehow this has to do with the fact that that product must be free of hazardous chemicals. But um, BIFMA compliant really only means that that product conforms to BIFMA safety and durability standards. So remember that BIFMA is the Business and Institutional Furniture Manufacturers Association, and their, their core mission is to uh, create those standards for health and safety, uh, product safety. So um, just to summarize, BIFMA compliant sets the standards on durability and safety for furniture, while level certified products have demonstrated multiple sustainability related aspects and those meeting credit 744 avoid the hazardous handful. Okay, next slide, please. The green screen certification for furniture and textiles is really brand new. It's just launched uh, this past November. The certification was developed to help certify products to Kaiser Permanente's uh, rigorous EPP furniture and fabric standard. The green screen certification focuses on the product's human and environmental health effects. In addition to restricting the hazardous handful chemicals, uh, the green screen um, certification also restricts additional chemicals of concern um, along with a handful of California 
property uh, proposition 65 chemicals. So a good handful of chemicals you'd want to avoid anyway. The certification also requires that manufacturers disclose information about the chemicals and materials in their product to the certifier. So not completely transparent, but a really good resource. Um, and again, with any, uh, many of these programs, there are three levels of certification, bronze, silver, and gold. The higher level of certification requires that the manufacturers certify their products to increasingly stringent material health criteria. So as much as you can, you'd want to be seeking out those silver and golds. <laughs> um, and in general, just to learn more about the green screen certification, you can contact Judy at CEH or they have a recorded webinar and that link will be active in the slides that you get at the end of this. And that webinar was done uh, just in October of 2020. So it should be very good information in there. Next slide, please. Um, so green building, I I know it, sometimes when dealing with the common green building rating systems lead well, more uncommonly living building challenge, it's easy to think that the programs exclude furniture, but really whether or not furniture is included is usually established at the point of registration for those projects. So if you have any, if you don't know, you should really ask the question to the project team, is furniture going to be part of the calculations because that's going to be really important. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is if you are are doing renovation or um, really anything, buying new furniture for spaces that are in a space that was previously certified, um, it's really worth checking to see if there are any of those credits that need to be maintained as you maintain the, the space or add new things to that space. Um, because those can also impact the overall ratings if there are any in the future. So anyway, I'm gonna start with a lead uh, just very quickly. Um, and this is not so much to, to talk about how to meet these credits, but simply that furniture and flooring also, but uh, we're focused on furniture here, um, can contribute to these credits. So just highlighting um, the, Obviously you can do furniture reuse is in its own credit, which is great. Um, there's a couple of, of opportunities under the building product disclosure and optimization credit for using EPDs. Um, under the material ingredients credit, this is where all of those labels that we were just looking at, the cradle to cradle, HPD, green health approved, um, green screen certified, declare all of these things can contribute to that particular credit. Um, there's also references to REACH, R-E-A-C-H, which is uh, a European-based reference and um, for any products that might be coming from Europe on your project. Um, under the environmental quality section, the EQ category, there are actually quite a number of credits that take furniture into consideration, but the low emitting materials credit is the only one that's focused on the ingredient, the material content of furniture. And it references uh, those BIFMA standards. So that's really good to be familiar with as you're going through. Next slide, please. Um, the well building standard focuses more on people in the building than on the building itself. And it actually has eight features that include furniture. And one of them is a prerequisite. So uh, the first one on the screen there on VOC reduction, again, you're getting familiar with seeing that BIFMA uh, VOC reference. If you have furniture that meets that, um, that would contribute to that credit. Um, and you can start to see some of the things repeating again here, PFCs, HFRs, um, the halogenated flame retardants, phthalates we know are associated with PPC and formaldehyde we know is associated with VOCs. Um, and you, could, you might notice this uh, BM1, this is under enhanced material safety. Uh, BM1 is a reference to green screens uh, chemical benchmarking system. And if you had an HPD on a product, you could actually use that to determine if you have any of those benchmark ca uh, chemicals in your product. So just noticing how these things are getting repeated and they kind of share the same language. So you'll hopefully only have to learn these things one time and then they apply to lots of different things. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, for the living building challenge, um, there are two imperatives. So one thing to note about the living building challenge, which because it's, it's not as common as the others, um, there's no options. You must do every single thing, which is why they're called imperatives and not credits or features. Um, there's only one item that would really apply to furniture and that's the red list. And this is applied to anything that comes into the building, building products, as well as furniture. And the red list itself is um, uh, maybe a hundred or so chemicals listed out and every single product in, in the project needs to avoid anything on that list. Um, and it easily, it includes the hazardous handful and obviously many others. So for that reason, um, declare labels and specifically the red list free red dot, um, that has become a goal for many projects that are not even associated with living building challenge, but they wanna meet that they, that idea of getting all of these uh, toxic chemicals out of their project. So those are, that's kind of like a little shortcut to look for. Um, but that is what I have on the green building system. So I will hand it back to Sarah. Great, thank you, Suzanne. And I'm actually gonna pass it over to Chris, who's gonna start talking about reupholstery. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and thanks to everyone who invited me to join. Um, it's neat to be part of the solution. Um, this slide actually represents what's happening all over the country in office spaces. Um, the, the, about seven or eight years ago, a trend started that we've all coined resi Marshall, or office spaces having environments that look like your living room or perhaps a spa or you know, hospitality in general. Um, so a lot of soft seating has been introduced to these spaces. Um, a fact that I um, wanted to share with you all is um, 70 to 80% of furniture is ending up in the landfill um, which is about five times as much as just 20 years ago. So we are rapidly um, buying and throwing out furniture. Um, it's very similar to what we've all been reading about um, with fast fashion. Um, would you do the next slide? So um, with reupholstery, there's a lot of benefits um, to having a piece of furniture reupholstered. Um, it's been a steady trade for a long time, um, actually a lot more popular um, for probably our grandparents' age and perhaps our parents' age, but I'd say further back. It used to be that someone would buy a living room suite of furniture when they got married and they would keep it the rest of their lives and reupholster it several times. Um, that is not the case any longer. Uh, but what I wanna do, what I'm, I'm, what I'm working towards is getting reupholstery as part of, in the vernacular of specifiers, of designers, um, so that when they have a new project that they consider reupholstery, um, and when you when you get to the brass tacks, the you know the very basics, um, which often has to do with money, um, there are three things on this list of how many do I have there? Twelve, of twelve reasons to reupholster that really stand out that um, uh, make it seem more palatable. Is that how you say that? Um, to going ahead and reupholstering in your project. Um, and the next couple slides I have will show you what these mean, but. We, it can be less expensive than buying new. Um, as Suzanne pointed out, you can get a lead point. Um, and actually the lead time is faster than waiting for the furniture to be made from a manufacturer, even if it's a manufacturer in the United States. If you could go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to show you three popular pieces of furniture um, in the commercial market. 
These are all um, ANSI BIFMA, really well um, approved, really made, well made, long term warranty products. And um, they have really good bones. So that is, of course, very important when you're reupholstering. Um, I would not say that all, um, obviously, IKEA, West Elm, even restoration hardware furniture comes to us that is not well made. Um, so the standards that are set by BIFMA can pretty much assure you that the, person, the, the piece of furniture will be um, worth reupholstering because of the longevity of it, the expected longevity. So as you can see, I don't need to read this off, but what I did here is with these three pieces is they're all in COM. And for those of you who do not know what COM means on this um, webinar, CO means com customer's own material. So the fabric is being given to us. Um, we're just quoting the labor. So these prices are the labor that it takes. Um, so even if it's a new piece of furniture, the HBF Perfect Pitch Chair will net somewhere around $1,100, whereas, and that means without the fabric yet, whereas the reupholstery of that same piece is $875. You start jumping up to some of the more iconic pieces like the Noel Womb Chair, um, it's, it's half price to have it reupholstered. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is just a real quick one. It's, uh, it's pretty obvious, but um, this, there's a, just a six week lead time for us. Um, we're a large reupholstery company in Oakland, California, and we can handle, um, you know, quite a few pieces at the same time. So um, the turnaround for a group of furniture is about six weeks. Um, whereas if you're gonna buy something new from the manufacturer, lead times are about four to 12 weeks, um, sometimes even longer. Next slide. And um, just again, the lead point that is possible. So if you reuse furniture, so if you're moving your headquarters and you, you reuse a certain percentage of your furniture, um, then you will get a point for that. You just, like Suzanne said, you just have to state it right at the beginning that that's one of your intentions. Next slide. Um, claim to fame, I love this, this project. Um, so San Francisco and the San Francisco airport have, well, they stated a goal of 2030. I don't think they're gonna meet it, but they stated a goal of 2030 of being zero waste. Um, and terminals one, two, and three have been uh, outfitted of since I think, you know, for probably we've been working on those for about 14 years. Um, I think terminal two was first, but right from the get go, Gensler specified um, some really high quality furniture to be put in the space. And, um, the ability to reupholster it many, many times um, was factored in instead of buying new furniture when they sh sh showed wear. Um, so we've got here the egg chair and the swan chair. You can also just kind of see in that photo, the Leland bench. So we have a contract with the San Francisco airport to reupholster about 60 pieces at a time. Um, so they're constantly in and out of our shop. Um, they do, of course, share, show a lot of wear. Uh, the egg chairs are leather and the swan chairs are a quadrat. Um, and this slide here um, talks about a couple things that I think are most important in reference to this conversation, again, is, is price. Um, it's four and five times more costly to buy these new chairs. So that means you can reupholster them four or five times and they only need to be reupholstered about because it's such a public space I'd say about every four or five years. Um, also just the carbon footprint is humongous. <laughs> it only takes about 27 miles to get the chair to us to reupholster it whereas these chairs are from Denmark and um, there's quite quite a journey for them. Um, the other thing I want to talk about right before I hand the slides back over is over and over, we heard that the chemicals that are used in upholstered 
uh, seeding can be toxic. And as Judy mentioned, only about five years ago were we allowed to make product in the United States without flame retardants. So another benefit to reupholstering is that we can switch out the foam to non-flame retardant free, to non-flame retardant foam um, when we are doing your upholstery job. So little by little, we can get that foam out of here, get it out of our country. Um, and same thing with the fabrics. If at fabrics, you know, we can, when we are working with you, we can select fabrics that are not harmful. And uh, happy to take any questions later. Thank you for listening. All right, Judy. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, we're going to fly through the next slide. So um, apologies for that. Uh, I just want to share that we have a new CEH furniture guide, which has the hyperlinks to the products included so you can see them. Um, you'll have our resources at the end slide, and you can filter by what the type of product you're looking for, manufacturer, et cetera. Next slide. Um, many, many manufacturers now produce chemical, uh, excuse me, products free of the chemicals of concern. This is a very small partial list. Many, many manufacturers now. Next slide. And I wanna put in a pitch for those of you whose logos do not appear on this picture. If your organization's logo does not appear, that means um, you have not yet taken the pledge to prefer products free of the hazardous handful chemicals, but all these other organizations have. So um, we can talk about what that takes. Just please contact me and we'll get your, you know, we'll get your logo up next time, hopefully. Next slide. I'm turning it back to, to Sarah. Thanks, Judy. And um, I just got a rainstorm here in Durham, North Carolina. So hopefully the the background noise isn't too bad. Um, just put in the chat if you're having any trouble hearing me. But um, next we're gonna talk about flooring and carpet. And as Judy mentioned, since we're running a little tight on time, I'm gonna try to talk a little bit quickly. Um, and as Judy mentioned, a lot of our work that we did on furniture was in partnership with Healthcare Without Harm. They're, they've been an amazing partner with us. And um, so we built on that work um, to team up again on our newest product categories, which are carpet and resilient flooring for commercial and contract settings. So uh, we use the same criteria as Healthcare Without Harm. So you can find um, information on their website or ours and it will match. So we know that when uh, purchasers and designers are selecting carpet and flooring, there are a lot of different things that you take into account from um, appearance to durability to how that product is going to be maintained to cost, um, all kinds of things. And also um, toxic content and, and toxic legacy uh, can be a part are important parts of that equation. So um, luckily, there are now a lot of products that um, that meet the uh, criteria that Healthcare Without Harm developed and that we've adopted for safer products. So um, we'll take a look at that in just a minute. So why focus on carpet and flooring? Well, we all know that carpet and flooring are tremendously high volume products. They're everywhere we go uh, in all of our spaces. And um, because of that, they can also be a, a significant source of waste. Um, they can be high turnover if, if they're um, wearing out quickly. Um, and uh, a lot of that waste, if it's, if it's not a safe product, it ends up in the landfill. So um, one of our goals with this is to try to support you all in reducing your, uh, your waste. Um, they can also be, the conventional versions can also be a significant source of chemicals of concern. So there's a lot of work done in the last several years to identify the various uh, hazardous chemicals and materials that are often found in conventional products. Um, we talked about indoor air quality before and health, um, the, the products themselves and the maintenance required to upkeep some products can really affect our, our health and well being. So um, the products that meet our criteria have a much uh, better uh, health and safety profile. And again, there's that opportunity for exposure across the life cycle. People working with these products or um, exposed to the chemicals that are used in the production or that are released during uh, disposal or destruction of the product. So um, this is really, we really take a life cycle approach uh, to, this, to these product categories. 
Uh, a number of frameworks were consulted in the development of the criteria that we're using. These will look familiar to you from Suzanne's slide. Um, and really it was determined that not that no one of these really covered all of the concerns that were identified um, by, there were a number of organizations that conducted research and identified potential uh, chemicals and materials of concern in carpet and flooring. And so because of that, Healthcare Without Harm um, used these frameworks and, and that research from groups like Healthy Building Network and the um, Department of the Environment at the City and County of San Francisco did a lot of work on this that was foundational and developed a new set of criteria that goes beyond uh, what we, um, what's found in those other eco labels and certifications. So um, you'll see here the long list of restrictions and requirements related to carpet and flooring. The ones in black refer to both resilient flooring and carpet and the ones in blue are carpet specific. And uh, we don't have time to go into detail on all of these. You, some of them will look familiar from Judy's presentation. Um, luckily, Healthcare Without Harm put together a really nice um, set of docu guidance documents that uh, describes all of the, um, that gives definitions and rationale for the restrictions and requirements for all of these uh, different attributes. So, um, and those are appended to the model specifications that we've developed and you can find them on their website. We can send those links out so you can sort of um, see the rationale for all of those uh, restrictions and the health hazards that are linked to them. So um, I do want to touch briefly on PVC or vinyl. Um, you may have heard that vinyl has gotten safer uh, recently, but we really, um, we just wanted to point out the many reasons why we restrict the use of vinyl or prohibit the use of vinyl in the products that we list. And um, one reason is that um, toxic chemicals, including mercury, asbestos, and PFAS are often used in the production processes of PVC. Um, PVC can be very, uh, is very carbon intensive production process. And often um, coal-fired plants and gas derived from fracking are used to fuel that production. Um, if the products are burned either in an incinerator or a wildfire or an accidental fire, um, they release toxic dioxins and furons into the air. And this, they, this also can have a significant impact on fence line communities, people who are living near the manufacturing or disposal locations for these products. Um, they also uh, can end up as microplastics, something we're all becoming a lot more cognizant of. Um, recycling rates tend to be very low. Uh, re recycled vinyl may contain legacy contaminants from prior formulations. Um, and we just want to point out that many large corporations and institutions have adopted policies that restrict PVC, and all of the products um, that we list um, don't contain PVC. So you don't have to buy PVC, you don't have to buy LVT, there are other options, and um, we are here to support you in doing that. Um, manufacturers that meet Healthcare Without Harm's resilient flooring criteria will look familiar to you. Lots of products, lots of formats, colors. Uh, shapes and sizes. And we also are really excited that after the development of these criteria, uh, Healthcare Without Harm and its sister agency, Practice Green Health, launched uh, Green Health Approved, which is a seal um, now that will uh, that products that meet those criteria um, will have. So it makes it easier to identify products that meet the criteria instead of saying these products meet the criteria set by Healthcare Without Harm. You can say these products are Green Health approved. So that is a new development as of the fall. Super exciting. Um, Healthcare Without Harm and Green Health or well, Green Health Approved is in the process of vetting products. So um, the criteria for carpet and flooring are the same as the ones that were introduced before the seal was announced. So that's really exciting. And right now they're reviewing products um, in carpet resilient flooring and medical products, which is one of their specialty areas. Um, so for right now, they're in that vetting process. Um, we know that a lot of products are being vetted. Uh, hopefully soon we'll have information for you all on which ones get the seal. But until then, you can just keep using the list of products for resilient flooring products that, um, that uh, were determined to meet the criteria previously. Um, and just as a, as a quick note, the product scopes for these products for resilient flooring really um, applies to resilient flooring that's um, not fluid applied polymers, um, 
not concrete, and it also excludes floor leveling compounds. And then carpet is uh, carpet tile and broad loom um, and padding, so every part of the carpet, but it, um, these criteria don't apply to, or the, the list won't include area rugs or outdoor carpets and rugs. So just a note on product scope. Um, until we have a list of carpet products that meet um, healthcare approved, um, green health approved, sorry, we are still recommending that folks use the SF approved, this is from San Francisco, list of products. Um, they have great criteria, um, strong criteria, and so this is a great source of information on safer products. And then just to touch briefly on um, Many of the same lead well and living building challenge credits or um, others are applicable if you're buying these safer products, they, they will help you to earn um, some of these credits. So um, buying safer products can help you meet those sustainability goals. Um, I'm just going to pass it to Suzanne quickly to talk about some of the things that you want to consider when uh, buying these products. Yes, uh, one of the, the biggest things to do, uh, especially when we're talking about either different types of floorings um, or something new to the to the institution um, is really engaging with the maintenance uh, with the group of people who's responsible for maintenance. That might be the facilities department. It might be a maintenance department. You just want to have the heads of those groups be aware of and be part of the process of deciding what's the new flooring going to be because they're the ones that are going to be responsible for it in the long run and we've seen so many problems uh, of you know products that maybe are new to that facility not being cared for properly and then they fail and then that makes everybody think oh the green product failed and it's no good um, anything requiring stripping and waxing is not even um, a product that's on any of the approved lists <laughs> in, in the resources that we've been talking about. That's just uh, that's just something we want to try to avoid altogether. So when as you're looking through uh, flooring materials, you really want to consider how does it need to be maintained and is it realistic for your client to maintain it in that way, um, and then and then making sure that that if there's special training, if there's special training that it gets passed on. So it's just really important to know, uh, to have that engagement with the folks that are going to be left being responsible for it. Um, and then finally, that's also really important um, because after you're not on the scene anymore, you know, when the, when the flooring is going to be replaced in many years later, um, that somebody at that facility knows that that flooring can be taken back and um, recycled or disposed of in a, in a particular way to keep it out of landfills, because that might have been a pretty significant part of the reason why you selected that in the first place. So we don't want to lose that continuity. So just lots of things to think about when you're doing that. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, follow those cleaning protocols and maintenance protocols from the manufacturer. Um, so in terms of resources we have available right now, as I mentioned, we have our, our model technical specifications for both carpet and resilient flooring that have those great reference documents appended to them from Healthcare Without Harm. We also have uh, an online um, list of products that meet the Healthcare Without Harm criteria. We can also provide customized technical assistance upon request. And coming up soon, we're going to have um, a guide to eco labels and certification to help you navigate that space. Um, a tool that will help assess total cost of ownership. We know some of the safer products might be a little bit more expensive on the front end, but um, their value pays off over time. And so we'll have a tool that helps um, determine that. And then also a fact sheet on healthier carpet and flooring that will help you make the case um, within your institution. And um, just a big, uh, the one thing that you can do to really help move uh, products towards, move the carpet and flooring market towards safer products is put those, um, ask your manufacturers to apply for Green Health Approved and put Green Health Approved in your RFP specifications and contracts. We're really, we would love to see more purchasers doing that because when you send that message, um, manufacturers listen and uh, we'd love to see this get traction. So thank you so much. Passing back to Judy. Thanks, Sarah. It is one 
15. And so I want to recognize that uh, we have reached our time and you may have other plans. Um, and we did not get a chance to do question and answer. If you submitted a question, uh, we will reach out to you after the webinar or please reach out to us. Um, there are a number of good questions. Um, I think I'll bypass this slide just in the sake of time. Um, we can always review it later. Sarah, would you just uh, keep going and we'll just keep going there. Um, we have a list, a lot of resources for you. We can talk about those later. Uh, next slide. So um, here's our list of resources. Please, um, they will all be hyperlinked and you'll be able to access them. Um, we want you to know that if you answered a question, we will try to answer the questions in some kind of an FAQ um, that we'll send out as a follow-up note. And we'll also send a post service, a post you know, questionnaire to find out suggestions other than have more time to discuss these wonderful uh, topics. Uh, next slide, I think that might be it. So I hope that you go back to your organization and you take this information and you share it with somebody in your office who has ability to do something with it. And then um, contact us to help you with your next steps. And then you're on your way. Once people get interested, they can take steps. And because it's been done so many times now, we have a great path forward. Next slide. I just want to thank our panelists, um, Chris Gokafer and Suzanne Drake, as well as my partner in crime, Sarah Packer. And um, if people would like to stand for questions, if our staff, our panelists are available, uh, we're happy to try and do that. So if you have if you have the ability to stand and you have a question, please do so. We welcome that. Or if our panelists need to head out, let me know. I can stick around. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sarah, do you want to uh, read this? I read, oh, we can read them. Yeah, I can read the question. So uh, we had a question from Shelly. Uh, I've been uh, confused about performance fabrics for a long time. They list themselves as eco-friendly, but don't they use PFAS, et cetera? Uh, for example, Krypton and Sunbrella. Um, I, can, I can touch on that. I was trying to type really fast, but I couldn't do it. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I, I think that the, the Yes, there's lots of different ways to be considered a performance fabric. Um, but as a designer, I would start with the fiber material, the fiber itself, and make sure that I think it's appropriate for the use. Um, you know, cottons and some natural fibers are not going to be as stain resistant in a high traffic area as um, as a synthetic fiber. So just trying to get the right fiber for the use so that you don't need to rely on coatings. So things like a Krypton, um, they tend to be uh, a finish on top of a fabric. And so we just try to avoid that altogether. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, polyesters and recycled PET fabrics, which are beautiful and really hard wearing. Um, there's a lot of the silicone fabrics that are coming out now that I can use instead of the PVC for, you know, a really hard wearing, like in a food area type of fabrics. So that's, that's what I would focus on is just kind of focusing on the fiber and not trying to make it do what it can't do. Yeah. Hopefully that, hopefully and that's helpful. I would add that Krypton has both fluorinated stain treatments as well as one non-fluorinated stain treatment. I think it's called C0. Um, and so generally most of the ones from Krypton do have fluorinated stain treatments with that one exception. Uh, I'm not so sure about Sunbrella. Um, Chris, do you have any knowledge about that? I think I've heard that it's um, integrated into the liquid like polymer makings, but it is added, uh, but it may be bound better than typically, but I don't wanna say any more cause I'll probably be wrong. Okay, next question. Okay, how um, are the foams and upholstery disposed of when we are reupholstered by Kay Chesterfield? Very good question and a very hard question to uh, come up with the answer. Um, at this point, anything that has been on the furniture actually does go into the trash. Um, we recycle the virgin foam. So when we're working with foam, um, on a new piece and there's any waste from cutting it to fit the piece of furniture, we can recycle that. Um, unfortunately, we made a step backwards and we used to be able to reupholster, um, 
um, recycle Dacron, which is very popular in reupholstery. And now I can't find any anyone in the Bay Area to take it. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're still working on solutions. It's Got a it. problem. When you put hazardous chemicals in materials, there really is nowhere to dispose of them. It's a problem for all kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next question. Okay. Um, this might be a comment. There is a free test for existing furniture foam that may contain flame retardants uh, with a link to Green Science Policy website. Yeah. So thank uh, you, Margie, for that. Judy, did you want to comment on that? I was going to say Duke University does that free testing and they can test for some number of flame retardants, but not all. So when you get your result back, it's a, probably a good indication. It's the most common flame retardants, but it's a little frustrating sometimes because it doesn't tell you with all certainty that it does not contain flame retardants at all. Some of the phosphates are hard to pick up. Okay. Um, thanks for that, Judy. Um, and I think this may be a, the same or similar question. What do you do with all the upholstery that you are removing prior to reupholstery? So I think you've already covered that, yeah. Chris, unless there's anything. No, that was the same question. Yep. Okay. It's a great question. Great. Okay. So then, um, I think the other questions were answered already, but one was about green cleaners and conditioners for leather furniture. Yeah, and um, I just did a quick search on Safer Choice, which is the EPA's list of um, safer chemicals for cleaning. There was one product listed, um, ironically is from Krypton. So <laughs> I hope it doesn't contain PFAS, it shouldn't, if it's from the EPA Safer Choice list. You can also look at the Green Seal list and uh, Eco logo. Anybody else want to add anything if they know more? All right. Great. So we'll, in our follow-up, we'll include those three labels um, that Judy just mentioned that are um, certified safer cleaning products. Um, okay. Do you, uh, this one is for Chris. Do you reupholster furniture from outside of California? If so, what is the process and is there a difference in time and price? Yeah. Unfortunately, it's cost prohibitive. Um, because of the pickup and delivery. Um, and as I mentioned, and when I wrote the answer to that question is, I am working on some kind of plan for the country so that there is an easier way to, so that there's a system in place. Um, so just stay tuned. And in the meantime, uh, talk to the reupholsters, ask them what kind of materials are they using and do they know about these issues? I mean, Chris is an exceptional person and they're not Chris's everywhere, but there are people who have been thinking about these issues, who've been asked enough about these issues to, to start to do some research. So you probably can find somebody in your area. Yeah, and there's, some, there's something that's really exciting that has happened in the upholstery profession is there's now a national organization. They're lit everybody was working in their own silo um, all over the country, all over the world. And just one year ago, was a national association formed. And so there are now monthly webinars. There's a lot of sharing. Um, we're getting more standardized. Um, so it's, it's, it's a profession that is, um, is growing in many different ways. Great, thank you for that, Chris. And thanks for being a model for, for other parts of the country. Um, okay. I think I heard that there's a report on the SFO furniture reuse effort. Any suggestions on how to obtain a copy? Judy and I both talked about that one. Um, okay. It's something that um, I'm working on as well. I've been working with the San Francisco Department of the Environment. Um, they're interested in creating a story. Um, and uh, I've just really gathered all the facts that I have um, so far. I also am in touch with the designer that specified the furniture um, from Gensler. So we're working on it. And if we find something, we will let you know. Um, the next question was about your go-to option for furniture that'll pass uh, mm. uh, 20, 117-2013. I can say nope. something and then Chris, you'll probably have some more to answer. Most fabrics will pass TB117-2013. Some of the natural fibers like cotton 
um, might have a more difficult time, but then all you need to do is add a barrier layer. Typically people use polyester, um, but Chris, I mean, please say more. It, yeah, it's pretty simple, which is lovely. There's, there, it's, it's nothing gray about it. You can, yeah, you can use a, another layer of some type of polyester. And even when we reupholster, um, when we use Dacron, since it is a polyester, as long as we're covering the whole piece of furniture with that Dacron, which normally we don't need to do, but if it's a requirement to pass, we can do that. Great, and I see an answer in here, a written answer from Suzanne too. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I was, I might have hit enters too soon. <laughs> oh, do you want to? I don't know. Uh, do you want to say more on that or? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, so, okay, here's another question from Shelley. How do we reach uh, Sarah? I think that's me to take the pledge she mentioned, and I'm actually gonna um, pop that over to Judy as our pledge, uh, Great. pledge owner. Um, I would absolutely love it if everybody on this call called me to find out how they can sign the purchaser pledge. Uh, right now, we have 22 organizations who've signed it, as well as other partners that can't sign the pledge because they're government agencies. But with all of their purchasing power, we represent over half a billion dollars now. And I want to get to a billion. That's my goal. So please contact me at judy at ceh.org. <laughs> um, one more question I think that's in here. What can we do to stop the manufacturer, ma manufacturing of vinyl flooring? Great question. Uh, great answer from Suzanne. Um, <laughs> stop sp specifying it. It's still a profitable market, profitable market for flooring. So yes, um, sp specify products that don't contain PVC. Tell people that you know that um, you know vinyl is, is a product that gets a lot of uh, publicity on television and, and in other places. And so um, just help spread that message that people, particularly those who work in the manufacturing and near the disposal of those products um, are really subjected to some pretty nasty chemicals and um, some bad chemicals are used in that um, production process. And so um, we uh, would love to talk more about that. We plan to talk more about that in the future. So stay tuned. Um, and choose a non-PVC product for your floors and for your other um, products that you specify. Yeah, I just wanna add there are costs and then there are costs. There are costs to you as the purchaser and then there are costs that the environment and people are paying as a result of our choices all over the world. So in these production facilities like in the Gulf Coast or in um, China, people are living in highly contaminated um, situations because of the uh, production there. And as I think, sort of, I can't remember if you mentioned it, but PFAS, asbestos, and mercury are used to um, in the production process of uh, vinyl. Those are, we talked about, those are like really uh, persistent chemicals or problematic carcinogens. And uh, we need to get them, or neurotoxins, and we need to get them out. We need to stop ordering this stuff. Great. Any okay, more? I, I think those were it. Does anyone? Panel, co-panelists, do you see any other questions that we didn't get to? Nope. Great. Thank you all so much for attending and for hanging in there. Uh, we really appreciate it. We will get back to you with the information as promised. And we will be sending a um, survey afterwards, so please fill it out. And please contact us just to know more and to let us know, you know, what's we can help you find the one step that you need to do to get this going in your own organization. Thank you again to our speakers. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.